Welcome to the first video for chapter nine, which is on energy balance and healthy body weight. The learning objectives for this video are to discuss the health risks associated with high and low fat mass, review techniques for measuring body composition, and highlight energy needs and some ways to estimate them. In the second video, we'll talk about strategies for achieving a healthy body weight. Before we get started with this chapter, I always want to point out that discussing body weight is a very sensitive topic for many people. And so it is important to remember that weight is just a number and health is all encompassing. And so our focus should not just be on weight, but as our lifestyle in totality. Body weight does not tell the entire story of someone's lifestyle. So you should never be judging someone or making assumptions about how they live or what they eat just based on how they look. Self-worth is not attached to body weight just because somebody may be extremely thin or of a much larger size does not say anything about how worthy they are. And then lastly, the focus of lifestyle interventions including nutrition changes, should always be about behavior change. And if we know anything about research and body weight and things of that nature, is that focusing too much on weight and the number on the scale can be detrimental to progress. So it should always be about focusing on adapting healthful behaviors and then accepting whatever outcome comes with those changes. With all that being said, we must recognize that there are problems, there being too little and too much. And so there are health risks associated with both ends of the spectrum in terms of body weight and fat mass. Both underweight and obesity are prevalent in the United States and globally. Here in the US, greater than 70% of the adult population is considered overweight or obese, as opposed to less than 2% of the adult population being considered underweight. We do have regional differences in body size. So you can see how the southeastern United States usually has the highest amount of people of, with uh, overweight and obesity. Uh, there may be a number of factors that come into play here. One of them being the accessibility of foods in these states. They're not gonna have your nice organic cafes and coffee shops, and sweet greens and just salads nearby. You get out into the highway, these places, and it's just strips of fast food restaurants, buffets, things of that nature. Another thing can also uh, that can also play a role is education level. Places like California and the West Coast, and then the Northeastern United States tend to have the highest educational level and awareness about how Nutrition and lifestyle impacts our health, and clearly that can play a role. Another thing to note with these images is just how things have changed over the last four years. So we can see how percentages of people have shifted into more people becoming, or a greater percentage of the population becoming obese. Looking at risks, we're going to start with being underweight. So three risks associated with being underweight is that an individual starts with poor energy stores. This is going to be detrimental if that person is faced with a wasting disease, something like cancer or HIV, or food insecurity. With these two problems, it is beneficial to have adequate fat and muscle stores because you anticipate 
that you're going to lose a significant amount. Number two, being underweight can lead to a rapid deterioration in the hospital. It's kind of the same concept is that you're starting with poor energy stores. But in the hospital in particular, this is going to increase risk of complications from surgery and also increase risk of pressure injuries, which develop from people being stuck in bed for a prolonged period of time. The third and final one, being underweight can have consequences to reproductive and bone health. So when somebody's underweight, they can have difficulty conceiving and have an increased risk for miscarriage, bone fractures, and osteoporosis. Three risks of being overweight or obese. Number one, increased risk of obesity related conditions. So things like obstructive sleep apnea and arthritis are associated with body fatness. Increased risk of most other chronic diseases, things like hypertension, type two diabetes, heart attack and stroke occur at a much higher rate when somebody is overweight or obese. And number three, complicated medical care. So when there's increased amount of adipose tissue or fat tissue, as well as skeletal tissue, uh, skeletal muscle, it becomes more difficult to accurately assess, uh, dose medications and perform certain surgeries. Some terms to know for overweight and obesity. Central obesity, this is when there is a high amount of visceral fat, which we'll see on the next slide, but visceral fat is fat that is packed in among your internal organs. Another term to know is body fat distribution. When there's high body fat near the abdomen with low body fat near the hips, this is called the apple shape. When there's low body fat near the abdomen with high body fat near the hips, we have the pear shape. And these are significant because the pear shape or how our fat is distri distributed is going to uh, determine our risk of complications. So the pear shape carries lower risk of complications, things like development of heart disease, type two diabetes, hypertension, compared to the apple shape. So these are things to consider when assessing somebody's risk of having complications of their body size. We can look at visceral fat and subcutaneous fat. Our gentleman on the left is considered to have a high amount of visceral fat. This is the dark matter that is packed deep within the abdomen. So you can see this abdominal wall that horseshoes around and all this stuff in here is the visceral fat. This is the fat that is associated with risk of disease. One, it is packed in near the organs and so it can have fat deposition onto the organs and then it is also considered metabolically active and can play a role in uh, hormones and other activities in the body that are thought to be detrimental. This is opposed to subcutaneous fat, which is the fat that appears just under, skin, under the skin, but above that abdominal wall. So this is the fat that you can pinch on the outside of your belly. And you can see our female on the right hand side has a high level of the subcutaneous fat, but very little visceral fat. So in terms of disease risk, we'd say this gentleman has much greater disease risk due to his high visceral fat content, as opposed to the female on the right. Then on the bottom, we have our fat distribution pattern this would be our apple type. So you can see this is where somebody would have a large big belly that you could kind of just like poke. 
and this is uh, associated with the increased risk of disease. On the right, we have our pear shape. This is where there's going to be the lower amount of abdominal adipose tissue with higher deposition in the hip area. And this is going to be associated with a lower risk of disease. So it's important to know the difference in risk with the apple and pear types, as well as difference in risk with the visceral and subcutaneous fat. That one being the one that has the increased risk of disease. We're going to look at a bunch of weight related assessment tools. There are many of them. They picked out a couple for us to discuss. We're going to look at body mass index or BMI, waist circumference, dual x ray absorptiometry or DEXA. Skinfold calipers, bioelectrical impedance analysis, BIA, and air or water displacement. First up is body mass index, also known as BMI. This is a simple calculation based on a person's height and weight. So you make this calculation and your result is going to fall within categories of underweight, normal weight, overweight, and obese. This is a tool that is used to make those calculations of um, risk of being underweight, overweight, obese. So they take people's disease, uh, what diseases they have, and they get their BMI, and then they collect tons of data from uh, thousands, tens of thousands of people, and then they get patterns, and they see that people that are on the underweight or the overweight and obese are gonna have different risks in certain conditions. BMI is the primary method of assessing weight status in hospitals. An advantage of BMI is that it's easy to perform and it also has high inter-rater reliability. High inter-rater reliability means that if I do it, if Johnny does it, if Sally does it, if Jacob does it, if Jonathan does it, then there's a good chance that all of us are gonna get the same results. And so we can pass from person to person and we can all get the same BMI. Disadvantages is that it does not account for fat distribution and body composition. So just by taking somebody's height and weight we are not able to capture other things that influence risk, such as our apple or pear shape and our amount of muscle tissue and our distribution of visceral fat versus subcutaneous fat. This is an example for BMI. For the exam, you'll wanna know uh, how to calculate a BMI and also have to um, place a BMI on the spectrum from underweight to obese. The formula for BMI is weight in pounds divided by height in inches squared times 703. So we have Mr. J who is 5 feet 11 inches and weighs 180 pounds. We'll first want to convert feet to inches. Um, I think there's a typo here, but it should just be feet to inches. So we can do five times 12 inches for each foot plus 11 inches equals 71 inches. So if he's five feet tall, he's 60 inches plus 11 is 71. Then we can calculate pounds per inches squared times 703 by doing 180 pounds divided by 71 times 71 or 71 squared, we get that result, and then we multiply it by 703, and we get 25.1. And if we look at this, we can see that Mr. J is just slightly overweight.
Waist circumference is another tool for assessing risk. This is a physical measurement using a flexible band. So you pass the band around somebody's midsection and then you measure it in inches. Risk of disease increases once a certain threshold is passed. So for females, that threshold is 35 inches and for males, it is 40 inches. This measurement is rarely used in the hospital setting but may be used in a clinic or a private practice. Some advantages is that it better predicts disease risk when compared to BMI. So it's actually a better assessment tool, but it does have disadvantages. It has low inter-rater reliability, which means if Sally does it, if Jacob does it, if Jonathan does it, if Paul does it, there's less of a, a chance that they're all gonna get the same measurement. It can also be invasive, especially if you're dealing with uh, somebody who is very thin or much larger, uh, can be embarrassing or put that person and the practitioner in an uncomfortable position. Whereas BMI, you can take a blind weight, you can get somebody's height, and it is not very invasive. Our example for waist circumference, it's taking the CDC method for measuring waist circumference. So, you have the person stand and place a tape measure just above the hip bones, which you do by touching and feeling where that hip bone ends. Then you wrap the tape around and make sure it's horizontal around the waist. You keep that tape snug around the waist and you measure the waist just after the per person breathes out. So you feel the hip bones up until you get to this space and that's where you're gonna measure from and then you record your amount in inches. Our next one is DEXA, or Dual Energy X-ray Absorptiometry. This is an advanced imaging technology used primarily to assess bone status. In addition to bone density, it can capture body fat and muscle mass. This is not widely used in a hospital setting and not all hospitals have them. So they're kind of a, a nice treat if you can get access to one. Advantages is that they have the highest level of accuracy, um, accuracy among the measurement tools and are minimally invasive. Disadvantages include they're expensive and they have a lower level of availability as opposed to the ability to BMI the waist circumference. This is what DEXA looks like. You have the person lay down on the bed and rest while a technician operates the machine and this is just going to scan the body. Once that's done, there will be a printout and you can assess uh, skeleton, you can look at the bone density, and then you can also get all these different kinds of measures about fat mass and muscle mass. It will also calculate the BMI. So you can get a lot of information from a DEXA scan and is considered to be very accurate. Other three measurement tools, I'm not gonna go into great detail on these three, but they're worth knowing about. The skin fold calipers are a way to measure body fat percentage. And so somebody picks several spots on the body. There's designated areas, this one being the down by the abdomen to measure the subcutaneous fat. This one is considered useful, but it also requires a high level of training to do it accurately. In the middle, the bioelectrical impedance analysis. This one is found at a lot of, uh, a lot of fitness centers and gyms. The technology has improved over time and now is considered to be relatively accurate. However, the BIA can be influenced by hydration status. So if you do two measurements with different levels of hydration, say you're dehydrated one time and you're very hydrated another, that is going to have an influence on the results. And for that reason, it is considered somewhat unreliable.
The one on the right, similar to DEXA, it's considered quite accurate and of value, but it is also expensive and somewhat rare. So that machine there is called a bod pod, and a person sits in it. I'm not going to pretend like I know exactly how it works, but essentially, when the machine is closed and it's empty, there's a certain amount of air that can fit in there. Then when you put a person's body in there, it's going to take up some of the space of the air. And with how much space they take up, the machine is able to give information about the person's body composition. With those skin calipers, and uh, we we're talking about body fat percentage. And so there's different ranges of body fat percentage. And they're going to be different for males and females. So males require less body fat at baseline than women. Women have extra body fat to assist with childbearing. And wherever your body fat percentage falls, uh, according to the American Council on Exercise, is going to give you a description of where you are. So athletes, depending on the athlete, uh, for male, 6 to 13%, you know, generally fit, good for fitness, 14 to 17%, average, 18 to 24%, and then above 25% body fat is considered obese. That's just for males. So those are the assessment tools. Now we transition into a discussion on energy balance. What this means is our body requires a certain number of calories per day to maintain weight. And so there is this balance of how much we consume versus how much we burn. With apps on our phone, it's quite easy to determine how much we eat. However, determining how many calories we burn is a little bit more difficult. So we have a certain amount of calories burned just to maintain normal processes in the body. And this is gonna vary widely between individuals. How many calories do I need? To figure that out, we need to recognize the three factors that influence it. The first one is the basal metabolic rate, or BMR. And this is just the amount of calories used to maintain normal processes, as I mentioned in the previous slide. The BMR is going to account for 50 to 65% of the calories burned. Then we have physical activity, and this can be the most variable depending on someone's physical activity level, can account for 25 to 50% of calories burned. And lastly, the thermic effect of food. These are calories burned through the processes of chewing, uh, digestion, absorption. This accounts for a very small amount of five to 10%. The amount of calories needed will ultimately depend on goal. For weight loss, you will need to consume less. For weight gain, you will need to consume more. And for weight maintenance, you will need to consume the approximate amount, approximate amount that is estimated from the three factors above. So you use these three factors to try to get a number of how many calories you need, and then you adjust accordingly to your goal. I'm giving you three tools for estimating calorie needs. The first method is the DRI method. This is where you're choosing from a chart of estimated energy requirement. And this is made by age, sex, and activity level. This word here should be chart, not charge. The DRI method is not generally used in practice. It is considered quite unreliable. What is used more in practice? is predictive equations. 
This is where you're plugging information about the person into validated question, uh, equations. One being Mifflin St. Gior, which is a very common predictive equation for estimating calorie needs. The third one is indirect calorimetry. This is a machine that helps to measure the exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen in a laboratory setting. I put indirect calorimetry in the same category as the DEXA and BODPOD, where it is very accurate, but there's decreased availability to it for the general population. First one is the DRI method. That one may be used by the general public, but generally not used by health professionals. This is just a snippet. You can only see ages two to seven, but basically the concept is the same. You look at age, you look at sex, and then you look at activity level, and then you go down the chart and you pick a calorie level. This is not considered to be very, uh, useful in accurately assessing calorie needs. Then we have predictive equations. This is the primary method of determining energy needs by health professionals. Mifflin St. Gior is the most common one used by dietitians. There's different equations for males and females. I just chose males uh, just to keep the example simple. So the equation for males is 10 times kilograms plus 6.25 times centimeters minus five times age plus five. If we have a 27 year old male who is six foot one, 195 pounds and is sedentary, we can do the work. It's not shown here, but how to get the pounds and inches into centimeters and kilograms. And then we just plug that into our equation. So, what we end up getting is 1,912 calories per day. That would be for weight maintenance. And uh, well, that will, be, that will be our BMR. That will be our basic basal metabolic rate. And then we multiply this number by an activity level. And there's a chart with activity levels where you do multiply by 1.2 through 1.5 for most people and you are going to increase the calories and that will give you your maintenance calories. The third one, indirect calorimetry. As I said before, it's the most accurate method of assessing needs, but is not widely available. This can be used in a laboratory setting for somebody at rest. So they sit down on this bed, it usually takes about 20 to 30 minutes. And this contraption is measuring the exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen. And through that, you're able to assess calorie needs. Another use for indirect cal calorimetry is with athletes. And so you can hook an athlete up to uh, indirect calorimeter, have them perform their exercise bout. And from this, you can determine how many calories they burn during that exercise bout. And that can help a sports nutritionist or sports dietitian help to appropriately, appropriately fuel somebody to be an athlete. Factors that affect BMR include age, height, growth, body composition, fever, and the hormone thyroxine. BMI is higher in youth, and then as lean body mass declines with age, the BMR slows down. Tall people have a larger surface area, so their BMI is higher. Children and pregnant women have higher BMR. Right? They require a high amount of calories in relation to their body mass. The more lean tissue or muscle mass somebody has, the greater number of calories they require each day. Fever raises the amount of calories required. And then thyroxin. I mentioned this in the minerals course or minerals lecture that high levels of thyroxin are going to increase the BMR. And so the function of our thyroid hormone can have an influence on our calorie needs.
That is it for the first video for chapter nine. The second video is going to include a series of tips for achieving a healthful body weight.